Well, once again, welcome. My name is Shelly Graf. I, you might remember me from being here a few weeks ago. It's good to be back with you all. And I think this is week six, is that right? Week six, you've made it this far, that's good. Do you have any smiles about that? <laughs> yeah, it is something to feel good about just, and then just having accomplished something like made it to a, a goal or a benchmark of that, perhaps that goal, but to really feel good about the commitment that you're making, that you're renewing, that we're all renewing day after day and moment by moment. That's something really beautiful to, and really hard, right? To um, recommit to exploring this path that touches all aspects of our lives. If it were just about awareness, you know, awareness itself, then it would, you know, that's just some, such a simple, a simple motivation to learn to be aware in some ways, right? But to learn about the power of awareness as an aspect of the completeness of the Buddha's path is really powerful. It's so powerful that it's hard to get a full sense of it in any moment. You know, I was reflecting as I was preparing for what I might say tonight, I was reflecting on my early days at Common Ground almost 20 years ago now, like close, something maybe 18 years ago. Back when Common Ground wasn't here, it was a few blocks to the east at Mark and Wynn's house, right, where, where it started, simple beginnings. And I just kept coming. I showed up one day and I kept coming and I remember leaving the, the you know, leaving the building so many occasions and thinking, I don't know what he was talking about, but there was something that compelled me to come back again, right? So it was like enough in a, in a moment or in an evening. It's enough of a, you know, it touches the, the teachings really touch the heart in a enough of a way that, that helps us renew that interest in practice again. And so we might feel the vastness of the path and the complexity of the teachings and how deep and powerful they are. But it's also really good to remember what matters is that we just keep returning, right? We keep remembering to be curious about why we keep coming back, right? So it's not just the coming back, but it's getting curious about why this matters, why it makes sense, why practice makes sense. And in these complex times that we're living in, it's a really powerful question, not just for Buddhist seekers, but for all spiritual practitioners, really. Uh, often it's the depth of suffering or the depth, depth of misunderstanding that calls us to ask the big questions. Well, how does it, how does intimacy really matter? It's so against the stream to be intimacy, to be in the middle of life as it is with all the, the swirl of difficulty, you know, yet, but what we're asked to do is to be there and to feel it. Like, oh, that's really radical, right? And to, to continue to cultivate this habit of love and kindness when we're in the middle of the swirl of difficulty and complexity is even more challenging, right? Be there, be intimate, feel it, and see if it's possible to not reject or to not hate or to not add some ill will to the moment, right? To not do anything violent. And that doesn't necessarily mean externalizing, it could, but it's also the kind of like, quickness that we are to that you know the habits of quickly judging or quickly blaming or quickly condemning ourselves although not our fault they're there we get to feel them and we get to practice cultivating a different relationship to this sensitive heart itself
I'm reading and teaching from this wonderful book called Faith. It's a wonderful book by Sharon Salzberg, who was um, one of the founders of Insight Meditation Society and a really powerful teacher and a teacher of most students, you know, of many Buddhist students has just been such a, a powerful force in the United States Dharma, Buddhist Dharma scene. And in the beginning of the book, she tells a story about having a conversation with a friend who is a therapist and asking the friend, what do you think leads to the transformation? What do you think leads to, in the relationship, leads to the transformation of heart in the therapeutic relationship, something like that. You know, I'm obviously paraphrasing. I don't have the book in front of me. And he says, love, the single most powerful thing, the pow most powerful force and transformation of the human heart. And Sharon is like, well, yes, you know, that's it's really powerful. The force of love, right? To to change the way we relate to life itself, our relationships with each other, our relationships with our own heart, the, the movement of experience and in the collective, you know, love really, we can see how love in all of its forms really changes things in a, in a single moment. That's not, probably nobody would deny that. But Sharon hypothesized that perhaps the single most important thing would be the client's interest in returning to their appointment, to the next appointment, right? The capacity to come back, right? Because without that, without the showing up, right? There's no learning. There's no, there's no possibility. And so just as you reflect on the last six weeks of showing up, you can feel that movement of goodness through your heart, right? That you just keep, you not only keep coming back to class, but keep showing up for your life and keep being curious about what it's like to be mindful and kind right here. And not just mindful and kind, but what it's like to be mindful and kind, to be present and intimate, right? to be sensitive to what's moving and to not take it personally. Because that's right there, that what we're learning, the depth of the Buddhist teachings really centers around this, this teaching about how to, how everything that moves experiences all the force of nature. It's not as it seems. And although we don't get that right away, right? And it may just like I kept coming back to a program at Common Ground week by week by week. And this may be your experience too, not knowing like what's, I don't really understand this. You know, the intellectual mind doesn't understand this, but perhaps the teachings are landing deep in the heart on a level that we don't quite get. And so that willingness to just keep returning to see like what is, what's more, what more is here? For me to understand this. It doesn't make sense not to be attached. I care about everything, but let me see about that. What's it like to really explore the teachings from their depth, but also from right here where I am? And as you can, as you already know, and can probably feel just in the comments that I've made so far, it's not easy. You've learned that too. It's really not easy to do what we're being asked to do, to be intimate, to be sensitive. Because the habits of the mind are to be distracted and, def and to be defensive, right? And so when we take up Buddhist meditation practice, we're actually training in 
being undefended, right? Being sensitive, being wide open in the middle of life, cultivating an undefended heart. And, and so it's, uh, the intellectual mind won't, won't ever really be able to get why that makes sense. The only way to get it is to practice it, is to be curious about it, like to keep returning to that question. Is it, you know, is it really possible now to be undefended with this memory, with this emotion, with this fear, right? with this, all that, you know, all the complexity of interpersonal relationships, all the, the in, inner torment, right, of, how to be in relationship with someone I care about. You know, that feeling when there's a conflict brewing or something is just tugging at your heart and that, you know, there's just so much there. It's the heart can be tight and burdened and there's so much going on, lots of thoughts and all of this. And so the idea of being undefended in a moment like that feels, I mean, you would probably go, well, why would I ever do that, right? <laughs> why would I be undefended when it really hurts or when it's really confusing, right? So the intellectual mind will never quite get that, but we're probably, we'll prob we probably have all surprised ourselves already being in a moment when it feels possible to be intimate, to be sensitive because of the training, because we're cultivating this habit that will just continue to show up moment by moment in our, in our lives. And so this training can be really simple, right? It can just be really simple. And it's our job to practice in simplicity and ease so that when things feel more complex, uh, complicated, then the habit will show up on its own. Right? And this, so the simplicity of carving out space and really committing to that. Finding a space in your house where you have a, a meditation spot, carving out some time during your day to go to your spot, dedicating yourself to that 30 minutes that you're going to sit, you're going to allow life to be what it is. You're not going to answer the phone or you're not going to worry about what happens on the other side of the door. Right? You're going to resist those thoughts to do all that house cleaning that feels so compelling in the moment that you sit down, right? Because you're going to remember, oh, this is where I train. And those thoughts, those compelling thoughts to be a doer, are, that's just habit too. The habit to wanna do, the habit to wanna avoid being sensitive, the, the habit to wanna avoid being with the torments of heart, with the torments of mind, with the memories and the grief and the emotions, with the plans, with the distractedness. You know, when we carve out time, when we sit down, when we get still, this is what we feel. We often feel anything but serene and peaceful. Nod your head if you're with me. So at least some of us are in the room. And so the power of returning, even when we don't know quite what this commitment is yielding, right? where it feels like, oh, this might be fine to blow this off today because I don't know what this is doing for me. But to trust that in the simplicity, this heart is learning how to be undefended. This learn heart is learning how to connect learning how to rely on sensitivity and intimacy and feeling what's moving in an embodied way, rather than being dependent on the intellectual skill, the intellectual mind to solve 
problems or to guide us through life. It's a very limited faculty, right? Intellect is important. Thinking is important. But feeling, being, being willing to stand up in the middle of our life, no matter what's going on, and de independent of conditions, when things are hard, when things are easy, when things are beautiful, when things are deeply unpleasant, that capacity to be equanimous is life-changing. Right? And probably all of us have some Yeah, all of us would like some of that. So our heart's defensive strategies, although they will have us take refuge in thinking about our experience, we're actually learning to feel into our experience, being open, letting it all in, and even letting our heart break, because that's often true too, that when we stop, when we settle, when we get still, we feel the movement of life. We feel how life has been moving through us for so long, right? Sometimes we just notice the unpleasantness of body sensations for the first time. Have you ever had that where you sat down on your cushion or your chair to meditate? And the body just feels like it's screaming. And, uh, and then we, we mistakenly think it's because of the meditation, right? Wow, there must be something wrong with meditation because the body's just screaming when I meditate. Well, often it's not because it's not because of the meditation. It's often because we haven't been connected with the body, right? And haven't felt the accumulated energies that flow through the body, haven't been able to attend to the body's needs, right? Because we're so busy thinking or doing. So such a simple moment, right? And we might be asking ourselves, well, how does sitting down on the cushion with knee pain, how does that translate to being in the middle of a very difficult situation with a dying loved one? Well, because we learn to accept, we learn to care about knee pain. We learn that knee pain is just knee pain. We le learn to be free with knee pain or with back pain or with a headache. A very simple moment, but very powerful because it's the training ground for all things. If we can learn to just allow, if the heart can really learn to be free, right? to be, to care, to feel, to be with, yet not to try to make it be any different, to realize the body is just doing what the body does. Right? The body's just an expression of nature. Every experience, every feeling, every movement of energy in the body is here lawfully. It belongs, right? And so with knee pain, we get to understand that. We get to understand that very deeply. And that allows us to be in more, you know, more complex situations. And we can be really humbled by that. Like, wow, it's so hard. It's hard to be with a simple difficulty. How about a recurring thought as an unpleasant experience? It's really hard. It's hard to be with that. But it's not that because our minds are bad or we're not good at it or there's something wrong with the meditation. It's just that we're feeling into this basic human predicament. And that is that human beings are always without an untrained mind a human being's untrained mind has very few options to try to find happiness. We gravitate towards pleasant and try to hold on to it for dear life, or we, and we avoid unpleasant situations, and we try to resolve any confusion with the, with the 
this simple intellectual expression, right? And so it's really powerful to be feeling into this basic, this profound human predicament right here in a simple moment. Like, oh my gosh, look at this. Look what happens. The mind just, you know, wants to get away from that which doesn't feel good. The Buddha had a, a description of what it's like to be human. He said that, you know, as a basic, uh, as a basic way to understand what it's like to be human, we're grappling with pleasure and pain. These eight vicissitudes are eight worldly winds. Pleasure and pain, we're grappling with fame and disrepute, praise and blame and gain and loss. And what we're learning to do is not get so blown away by these, by these winds. Right? So that we have some, we have some, we have a, a possible, we have a capacity to not just be dependent on praise, right? But to feel, but we feel the power of praise and the, uh, inclination to sort of get really glued to it, right? And we also don't have to be compelled to resist blame because we can just see it as a force of nature so that we don't have to go like, oh, I don't want to hear anything about, you know, how my inadequacies, we can learn to sort of like take that, let it move, not be so attached. And the same goes for pleasure and pain, fame and disrepute. So with these worldly winds, with learning how to be intimate in our lives, we're learning how to, we're developing a capacity to be at ease no matter the circumstances. And this is only possible because of wisdom. It's only possible because wisdom yeah in really simple moments begins to see like oh wow look at this this isn't this isn't so personal it's not my fault and we get we start to see the power of feeling and letting it move right? with knee pain or something really simple like that And so we're going to do a little practice tonight. And we'll start with doing a little loving kindness practice. And then we'll move into, I'll guide us through it. We'll do a little loving kindness and then we'll do a little awareness practice. We'll explore working with an anchor, which we've been practicing already. And then allowing the anchor to just sort of fade into the background and being willing to uh, experience, uh, welcome any experience which supports us in how to practice in daily life when there's a lot of changing objects, right? We can't just be with the breath, for example, when we're driving or something like this. And it's really nice to be able to start with loving kindness, right? Because this is, I think as Mark talked about last week, I think he talked about um, cultivating uh, skillful attitudes and loving kindness or the forces of love, all the forces of love in many, many forms, right? Can be a wonderful attitude that helps us be in the middle of experience. And what we learn is that Sometimes we make a big thing about love and expect it to be something really powerful that we feel like, oh God, I feel so much love right now. And it can happen that way. But more often, 
loving kindness or metta is very light, right? When there's a moment of open-heartedness, when there's a moment of int intimacy or sensitivity with life, there's necessarily a bit of loving kindness that's there. The heart wouldn't be able to open. Without kindness and ease, the heart's not able to be here. The not, heart's not able to be with. So we can start to feel in the relaxed body and mind, this capacity of heart to actually be here. Like, ah, oh, easeful, right? How nice, not resisting not fighting, not being in contention with life, that lightness is the impact of love, is the impact of metta. So it doesn't have to be this great grand experience, but it can be very simple, right? very ordinary. And so we're gonna practice cultivating a little loving kindness, but first just wanna invite us to move a little bit. So. You can even stand up right where you are. You can take maybe a deep breath. I've been talking for almost a half hour now. So yeah, just let your body, invite your body to move its energies. If you're at home and you wanna step away from your computer just for a minute, hold the shoulders even, adjust the body. And then when you're ready, just finding a place for the body to reside for the next half an hour. Taking your time with the settling. We sit with a dignified posture. Really taking our seat. And just for the next half an hour, we can commit to being here with any and all of the conditions. Training and not needing to chase after something more pleasant. or something less unpleasant. But developing a courageous heart. And it's okay if we have to renew an interest in the present moment's experience, 
a bazillion times. That's really okay. No problem. This is how we learn. You can feel into the body. Trusting intimacy. Feeling the weight of the body. The temperature. or whatever other predominant experience calls the attention. Letting the body to be at ease. Relaxed. You might notice the heartbeat. You might notice the breath. So wise just to invite awareness to take up an exclusive interest in the breath for a few minutes. Just to feel into the possibility of stabilizing awareness. With that, it's possible for this heart to be aware. Aware of breath. Moving in, moving into the body. And out of body.
And we can appreciate that feeling into the body is a way of caring about the body. Feeling into the breath, being intimate with the body's systems, It's a way of caring about the body like we would a friend. Friend we were listening to. Just listening to the body. Listening to the breath. So often forget about the body. How well, nice to just reconnect. I appreciate this body. Vulnerable and strong. Systems working together. If you'd like to, you can <clears throat> repeat some phrases. I think the body, our goodwill. May this body be happy, and peaceful. safe and protected, healthy and strong. Allowing that the energy of metta the heart that cares to connect with the experience of the body we care about this body. We appreciate this body.
May this body be happy and peaceful. Safe. And protected. <clears throat> healthy and strong. Simple good wishes. I care about this body. May this body be happy and peaceful, safe and protected, healthy and strong. Staying with the body as long as you'd like. And also just feeling into the sensitivity of this heart mind. Hearts are so sensitive. moved by so much in our day, in our lives. Touched by experience, by happiness, by pain and sorrow. By thoughts and emotions. The body is sensitive, the heart is sensitive. You can appreciate the sensitive heart and the beauty and challenge of having a sensitive heart of being a sensitive being. And when the time is right, offering some simple goodwill. I care about the sensitive heart. I care enough to be here, to feel what's here, to feel what's moving. Cultivate intimacy to 
not reject anything. In this heart, be happy and peaceful. Safe and protected. Healthy and strong. Courageous. I care about this sensitive heart. I care about feeling, being intimate. I honor this heart sensitivity. May this heart be happy and peaceful. Safe. and protected. Healthy. And strong. Remembering that the capacity of the heart to care is boundless. Sensitivity, care, is boundless. We can have a felt sense of all the sensitive hearts in the room, in this class. We care that human beings are sensitive. Tender, the care that sensitive human beings feel. and extend our good wishes far and wide, touching the people in this class and beyond.
May these hearts be happy and peaceful. Safe and protected. Healthy and strong. Feeling into what it's like to care. Abiding in the heart's goodness. Heart's goodness that has no limits. Providing and sensitivity and care. And then when you're ready, transitioning back to awareness of breathing. Just feeling the breath. Feel the breath that flows in and out of the body. And see how metta connects right here with our mindfulness practice. Welcoming the breath with an undefended heart. Not demanding anything of the breath. Just receiving. No, not even holding tightly to the breath. 
allowing it to be in the foreground or in the background. Welcoming any experience into awareness, practicing a more open style of awareness now. Perhaps we notice the breath and then notice sound. Feel the body sensation. The air of the blower, the warmth of the blanket. Saying yes to any experience that comes into awareness. Remaining relaxed and open. Not demanding anything of life. For the last five minutes or so, we can even open the eyes a bit. Let in a little light. Continue our cultivation of ease and acceptance. Inviting any experience into awareness. Not holding tightly to the breath or to anything. Just being in the middle. Practicing in this very simple way, being right in the middle and saying yes.
And welcome to open the eyes and stretch the body a little bit when you're ready. Again, it's okay to stand up or move away from your screen. If you'd like to for a minute or so. They're expecting, we're expecting progress to be more of a linear, right? That as we go through the six weeks together, there's learning that builds and, you know, there's an obvious knowing of improvement and that's just not the way it goes with meditation, is it? Yeah. And it's not that there's not learning happening, you know, we can, but it's a lot, it's a lot more like this, right? <laughs> so we're sort of like, circulating around themes and deepening into those themes and that's how yeah and, and maybe it is more like this or other ways to describe it with our bodies yeah but it's definitely not linear yeah and yet we can feel the impact the fruits of practice in moments too right and so you know back to what i was saying earlier in the evening about how how important it is to uh, to remember that it's not it's not uh, what we're learning and how we're growing isn't dependent on our own will or whether or not we're good or bad, right? Or whether or not we're good at this meditation thing or bad at it, or whether or not meditation is good or meditation is bad. It's actually that. The, the teachings, the practice itself is so complex, right? It's so deep, maybe complex is like actually quite simple, but it's so deep that the whole system, our systems don't grok it right away, right? So it's like, you know, what I was trying to illustrate with that, with uh, pointing to how I, I would just come back week by week and listen to Mark's Dharma talks and leave thinking like, I don't really know what he was talking about, but I kind of do, right? And then I would come back the next week. And there's, so even if the intellectual mind goes like, I don't really know what I'm getting out of this, but we keep coming back, then there's just another moment to deepen into experience, to deepen, in, to deepen into the fullness of the path right, the fullness of the teachings. And one of the primary ways that we do that is by remembering that, ah, oh, this, right, even though, you know, last night when I sat on the cushion, that I noticed some calm or tranquility, the mind was less busy or something like that, and that was nice, but tonight, it's very different, right, and everything, my mind is all over the place, the body is screaming or whatever the case, well, we start to understand one way that we deepen is to understand, oh, this is just nature. It's not actually self, right? And so there's no need to take fame personally, just as much as there's no need to take disrepute personally. There's no reason to take tranquility personally and there's no reason to take distraction personally. We understand that every, in every moment, there's a coming together of experience that is this, right? It's just this. And what a relief to not have to be, to not have to take life so personally, right? To not have to be at the center of, to not have to be the blame for something or to actually be the one that has made it happen, but to realize like, oh, wow, you know, it, it just opens up so much capacity for us to be in the middle of a very complex moment and, and stand our, you know, stand in the middle of it. Yeah. 
because we don't have to crumble, right? Like it's so powerful to feel, to stand, uh, yeah, examples of relationship come to mind quite often for me, like, and with friendships or my partner, you know, just to be there whilst my partner's giving me some unpleasant feedback and to feel like, ah, oh, look at that. I'm taking, look at this feeling of taking this personally or feeling like I'm a very, I'm a terrible human or feeling like she doesn't love me anymore or feel like I'm unlovable and I'm not lovable right now or just to feel it, right? To be like, oh yeah, look at all this. It feels like this right now. And how it's so, there's just a moment of such a courageous heart being known. Like, oh, wow. It's kind of powerful, right? To be a student and to be learning something in the middle of life as it is, in the middle of our relationships the way they are, in the middle of our unfinished business as human beings the way it is. And that comes from this, yeah, just this willingness to go like, oh, yeah, look, the distracted mind, it's distracted today. It wasn't yesterday. The conditions are different, right? It's not because I'm bad or wrong or meditation is bad or wrong. It's just that the conditions are different. It's amazing. When conditions come together in a particular way, it's like this. And when they come together in a different way, it's like this, right? And how many times do we learn that by... You know, if you've, you've probably been in a very similar situation and, and one, at one moment had a feeling of joy and in another moment had a feeling of uh, whatever, <laughs> not non-joy, <laughs> right? Or kindness or non-kindness. I was actually thinking of a friend who said something to me just um, that used to annoy me and I actually... I, you know, was talking to this friend and they said the same thing. And I was like, oh, okay. It didn't annoy me. And I caught that like, oh, well, look at this. It didn't annoy me this time. And there was the, there was the inclination to go like, oh, you're such a superior human being in this moment, <laughs> right? And to take it personally. But then I caught that too. Like, oh, look at that. Wanting to hold on to it, wanting to cling to something like, ah, oh, to stick my claim in it, like I am a good human now, like there's proof <laughs> until the next time. It totally annoys me and I feel like, oh, I'm a failed human being. But the most interesting thing is just watching that be different, right? You know, like conditions were here to yield the same thing as they did a different moment, right? And so we learn to be more free and courageous in life. It doesn't have to, life doesn't have to rock us. We can be more relaxed in the middle of really difficult circumstances. And there are many really difficult circumstances in and around us these days, right? So it's really good practice. Yeah, so there, there's a question in the hall here about the meta phrases. Um, and there could be you know, many different phrases, but the phrases I used were maybe, or may this body or may this heart be safe and protected, right? And what about the reality that we're never completely safe or never completely protected? And then what do we do with that? How does that reality square with this beautiful wish to be safe and protected? Well, you know, often the mind will. So, so when I, when I say safe and protected, I, I do, sometimes there is, it does invoke a, uh, a feeling of physical safety and protection. And even though I understand that there is no complete safety and protection in the world, anything could happen at any moment, there, it's still a beautiful wish for this body to be safe and protected. It's still a beautiful wish, right? And it still protects the heart from being afraid sometimes in moments of real fragility, right? It doesn't it doesn't help keep me any more safe to walk around feeling afraid than it does to walk around feeling open and aware, right? So, so the, the, the suggestion, the, the cultivation of the heart that cares about safety and protection 
can still be a benefit even as we live in the re reality of fragility. And so in, a, in addition to that, in a sort of deeper way, we can think about protection, safety and protection as being like the protection of love and wisdom, right? May I be protected by love and wisdom. To me, that really, you know, is like, oh yeah, an alignment, like no matter what comes my way, may I be protected by love and wisdom. May this heart be protected with, by love and wisdom, by metta and understanding. Right? So in a moment when life feels like it does, as beautiful as it can feel or as difficult as it can feel, may, may the heart be rooted in something deeper than the swirl of the eight worldly winds, for example, right? By the compulsion to be a good somebody or a bad somebody, by the compulsion to make someone else a good somebody or a bad somebody or an evil somebody, right? May love and wisdom meet me right there. May it meet us all right there so that I, we can find a, a way to stay yeah, to stay alive, to stay engaged, to, to remain, to renew our interest in seeking the depths of love and the depths of wisdom. Right? Yeah. Does that help at all? Okay. Well, one of the handouts for week six, um, the handout that Mark made, it's called integrating practice into daily life. Do you have a chance to look at that yet or maybe next week? No. Well, it's coming up. So um, I love integrating practice into daily life. And <clears throat> Mark offered six really nice strategies for doing that. And I thought I would just talk about, talk about integration a little bit for the next five minutes or so, and then we'll close our time together. When we can remember that <clears throat> every moment of our lives is a moment to deepen into love and wisdom to to learn to trust sensitivity as a guiding force in our life rather than trusting distraction or delusion or denial. To trust intimacy rather than relying on yeah, disembodied, cold, closed down, habits that are there as a way of protecting, confused protection, strategies of protection. You know, we, we can remember this really often, all the waking hours, there's just so many opportunities, right, to grow and to, if we limit ourselves to <clears throat> the 30 minutes or so that we sit on the cushion, then there's just so much time that we're really not yeah, that we just are forgetting about. So it's nice just to remember that, oh yeah, that every moment of our life is a moment to grow into the healthy human being, to deepen into an understanding of these teachings and the practice, and that it doesn't have to look a particular way all the time, right? That we can understand something about what it means to be dignified and to take our seat by sitting on the couch, by, you know, by really taking a stand when we're really meeting someone that we love right in front of us, having a conversation, just like we can when we sit down, when we decide that we're just going to be here, no matter what the conditions and close our eyes and get still, right? It's a similar alignment. It's a similar alignment of values and intentionality that we bring to the moment. Very different conditions, 
but a similar intentionality. I have a friend who is, uh, have been, you know, practicing, well, I have too, but um, yeah, loving kindness has been a real force, a real amazing practice. Um, something that I haven't early in practice really was hard for me and have for many years now really relied on loving kindness when I don't know what to do or when life feels really hard or life feels impossible or something, then to like there's this heart really trusts the movement, you know, that that kind of freeing energy that can be there. Maybe you notice that a little bit when we're practicing that just the cultivation of love, even if more, even if different experiences or different expressions of the heart arise, like even if you notice tension or tightness, or even when I notice I'm cultivating love, but I notice ill will, or, you know, I bring to mind someone that I want to cultivate a loving awareness towards and all I feel is like saltiness right like uh, you don't deserve this or something like that even in these moments like what I notice is that the residue of that practice you know makes the heart a little more nimble and so that also makes me trust the practice a little bit more and so there's many strategies like I've really gone gotten a lot from top to friends who have done these practices over time to 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 uh, feel the creativity there and so loving kindness is one of those practices that we can really take with us everywhere right i have a friend who every time they get in the car they practice loving kindness sending loving kindness to all the drivers right and in part because you know, driving can be stressful <laughs> and can bring out the worst in human beings. So as a way to, yeah, just develop a good skillful means in, in the car around driving, just to practice that. Or to, you know, if I had a taught MBSR, an MBSR class, and a student once said that they really had a hard time finding the time to dedicate 45 minutes every day to sitting practice or to a body scan or something but they did have 45 minutes on the bus on the way to work every day. And so they practice loving, cultivating a relaxed, loving attention on the bus, right? Receiving the coldness, receiving the sounds, receiving the people, receiving, you know, whatever was around and, and really practice receiving that in the spirit of love and kindness and, um, and an open-hearted, undefended way. So I just love that. And then, you know, one more, one more daily life practice that has been really useful is just, uh, you know, we are very often very busy doers. Nod your head if you have a lot to do in your day. Yes, right, who doesn't, right? And so just uh, undermining that habit of just doing with remembering to relax because that's a very important skill in meditation right we have to cultivate this habit of up uprightness this dignified posture and a lot of interest in mind with an equal habit of relaxed ease right or it doesn't work or restless or you know there's just not uh, a balanced energy there for practice and this is true all the time too so we often are cultivating the doing, the interest, right? The moving something forward. And we neglect the relax, relaxing part. Um, it's easy to lay, lie down on my bed and just fall asleep because every I only lie down when I'm gonna fall asleep. So often I'll, I'll just lie down for like 10 minutes, just you know, in the middle of the day, if I can, if I'm working from home, if I'm working at common ground, I'll lie down on the bench, I'll come into the meditation hall, I'll just practice lying down with the intention to relax instead of sleep, just to remember like, oh, this is possible. It's possible to cultivate an energy of doing along with an energy of relaxing and, and ease. And I'll often do this at home, just sitting on the couch with nothing to do, right? 
spent a lot of the time I'll catch myself if I sit down in a, a nice comfy chair or something, you know, it's because I have, I'm going to study, I'm going to prepare, I'm going to do something, I'm going to be on my computer. But, you know, what if I just sit without any agenda, without having to solve a problem or think about something, but just with the intention to just, just to be there and to be at ease without any ambition at all in mind. So these are just very simple ways to uh, bring the practice alive in daily lives, just to add to the, the wonderful um, five uh, items that Mark offered as well. And just to state what they are, uh, Mark, number one is remember the teachings. So just to remember, just to bring the teachings to mind, right? The possibility, just is like aligning with the possibility, like a possibility of nature. Uh, Practice isn't, you know, doesn't yield linear results. And number two, choosing a place, a difficult situation in your life and turning that into a practice opportunity. So looking for that, right? For a long time, anxiety was that for me. So social anxiety, often I would just look for it, ask my teacher and see what I can learn, see what I can learn, see what I can learn. And number three, create one time each day to practice relaxation, something I was just suggesting. Number four, slowing down and doing one thing at a time can be very powerful, right? Great suggestion. And then number five, infusing all activity with kindness, forgiveness, patience, and humor. Even when you're driving, even when you're at work, even when you're on the bus, even when you're cooking dinner, even when you're using the toilet, even when we're brushing our teeth, all kinds of things. So my hope for you is that you enjoy the next week of practice. You come back in week seven, continue to renew interest in learning along the way. Yeah, and appreciate the deepening journey that it is. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here. It's good to be with you all. Yeah, take care. <laughs>